Hello everyone and welcome to the melting point and TLC experiment. For this experiment, we're not actually going to do an experiment. So basically I'm just going to walk through a lot of this worksheet as well as some of the post lab questions to make sure we're on the same page about the analysis for the recrystallization experiment for experiment one. And then also this is a good preparation for experiment three, which as you can see here is the liquid liquid extraction experiment. In that experiment, we're gonna isolate two compounds. So basically there's gonna be a mix of a one-to-one -one ratio of these two compounds. We're gonna isolate them from each other. Once they're dry, we're gonna do a melting point analysis and TLC analysis on those compounds. The melting point analysis you've already seen in experiment one, we're just gonna talk about what that means and how to interpret that in more detail in this presentation. Also for the liquid liquid extraction experiment, we're gonna be assessing the percent recovery but we'll look at that more in more detail in that specific video. All right, so for experiment two, again, we're doing melting point and TLC introductions for you. For this experiment, hopefully you've already um, read through the first five pages or so of experiment two and taken the pre-lab quiz. This presentation is gonna be pretty quick and it'll be more beneficial if you take a little bit of time, read that first and take the pre-lab quiz before looking over this. After you watch this video, you're going to take the post-lab quiz and then also do the first 12 questions on this post-lab worksheet. All right, for preparation for lab, usually it says um, lab notebook inspections are going to happen at the beginning of lab. We're not actually going to do lab notebook inspe inspections because this is all done via video. And the lab notebook pages are due at the end of lab. You will turn in your lab notebook pages for all experiments except for this one. So for the first experiment, turn in your lab notebook pages and for all remaining experiments that are in this e-workbook, you're going to be turning in your lab notebook for those as well. So worksheet here is the post-lab worksheet and that again is due for all experiments. With each experiment, there's a general preparation for lab outline of things that you should do. Um, watch the technique videos that are in the module on Canvas. That's always helpful before you get started, before you take that pre-lab quiz, and then also read the experiment. Again, very helpful because the pre-lab quiz usually consists of the first five questions within the actual experiment. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail as we move through here. And again, one more time, you don't need to worry about your notebook for this experiment. This is the only experiment that you don't need a notebook entry for. Moving on to the table of reagents. Honestly, it doesn't seem all that relevant right now because we're not actually isolating a product from these reactions. We basically have starting chill and we're doing a purification or separation of two compounds, but we're not having we're not transforming it into a product that we're analyzing need to calculate the percent recovery. But it's good practice to get comfortable with this because once we get to that point, specifically for the PET hydrolysis reaction and all the experiments thereafter, it's very important to become comfortable with the table of reagents, which is why we're jumping into it as quickly as we are. So for these, one good thing to do is always look up the molecular weight of the compounds that we care about, specifically for this, this is the analysis of benzoic acid from experiment one. So let's just quickly look up benzoic acid and then also find the melting point of that because that's one of the specific measurements that we're doing in this experiment is assessing the melting point of benzoic acid. So if I go to Google and do a general search for benzoic acid, um, quite a few things come up. I could go to this PubChem entry for benzoic acid. That'd be fine. I could go to this Wikipedia entry, which is actually right here. This gives me the molar mass, 122.12. I could use that, but I highly recommend at least checking it to make sure the structure matches up with what you're looking for. So this is the structure of benzoic acid. This is the name of it. So that would have been fine to go ahead and use, but there's, I again, I highly recommend going to double check it because sometimes things like a benzoate salt might be there, this is the main search result, rather than exactly what you're looking for. So scrolling down again, the, mo the molar mass, which is the same thing as molecular weight, is 122.123. It gave 122.12. Always use two decimal places, at least, for molecular weights. It gives more information, which is interesting for the previous experiment, which is the solubility in water. And then it also gives the melting point, which is 122 degrees Celsius. I think for the table in the last experiment, you were given the um, melting range is 122 to 123, which that's been found in other publications, so I'll probably stick with that. 
So it's also um, just an interesting coincidence. This rarely happens that the molecular weight is actually the same as the melting point because it's not the same. It's different units, but um, so for the molar, the molecular weight or molar mass, the same thing. That was one twenty two point one two, and then I'm going to go ahead and enter melting point here, and we'll say that was one twenty two to one twenty three degrees Celsius. It's really only the the only two crucial values necessary for this table. Um, so for the for the mass of it, we could say what that is, but really that was more the previous experiment when we were doing the recrystallization. So all we're really doing here is just the melting point assessment and TLC assessment of the benzoic acid isolated from the last experiment. So there's really nothing else all that relevant for this. We could maybe write in the hexane's ethyl acetate ratio that we use for the TLC analysis. Um, but again, it's not all that crucial. Now the density, that might be something to look at. We, we're going to actually look at that quite a bit more um, in some of these later questions, um, as well as just understanding the TLC plate analysis. So let's go ahead and look up some information for hexanes. And Wikipedia is usually a pretty reliable source for this. So let's just see. So hexanes usually is a large is a mixture of things like isomeric similarities to that. So let's just look up an isomer real quick. So 2-methylpentane is an isomer of that. It also has six carbons in, in the same formula. So it's got six carbons and 14 hydrogens, which hexanes also has, which is why that is referred to as hexanes. But let's just get the information for hexanes. So the density of hexanes is 0.66 grams per milliliter, so that's less dense than water. If we were thinking about a separatory funnel, that would be the layer above water in a separatory funnel. Um, and that density value is what we were looking for. So 0.66 is the density value for hexanes. So we could go ahead and draw that in here. So 0.66 is the density value for hexanes. We could look at the molecular weight for that. Again, if it was part of a reaction, we would definitely do that, but really hexanes is just either carrying the compound up a TLC plate or dissolving it in solution. So even in this case, it's not really all that crucial that we have the molecular weight for hexanes. We could write it down. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm just going to move on though so we can get through the video. So ethyl acetate is the other compound. Let's look up the density for ethyl acetate. Um, so ethyl acetate is the name of this. Ethyl ethanoate is a different name for it. So if you have an ethyl group attached to an oxygen of an ester functional group, you could also call it ethyl ethanoate. Ethyl acetate is the most common um, thing used in lab and also a common abbreviation you're going to consistently see for ethyl acetate is ETOAC. So I've used that on um, specific quiz questions um, and exam questions as a common abbreviation um, that you should be aware of. All right, so we're looking for the density of this. So the density of ethyl acetate is 0 0.902 grams per cubic centimeters. A cubic centimeter is equivalent to a milliliter for our purposes in organic chemistry. So you could just report this as 0 0.902 grams per milliliter. So 0 0.902 grams per milliliter. All right, this brings us to a good point where we can talk about what this would look like in a separatory funnel. So this is my not so great drawing of a separatory funnel, but hopefully we can see what this is. So if we had hexanes and ethyl acetate to a separatory funnel, just led by looking at the density, you would guess that ethyl acetate would be a bottom layer because it's more dense than hexanes. However, both of these two organic solvents have a lot of carbons in them and they're fully soluble in each other. So really what we would see in our separatory funnel is a one-to-one -one mix of hexanes and ethyl acetate. They would not be two separate layers even though they do have the same or they have different densities. Now if we added water into this separatory funnel, both of these are less dense than water, so if we actually added water and water would be the bottom layer, so this would be water, 
and then the two solvents would be the top layer. So this is a, a side note, really, but I just want to clarify that even though the distant the densities of these two are different, they are still soluble in each other. All right, so moving on, let's focus on melting point first. So the literature value for the melting point of benzoic acid is 122 to 123. That's what I mentioned earlier, so that's what we put in our table. For this, that means that if we have pure benzoic acid, the melting point that it starts melting is going to be 122 degrees Celsius, and it will stop melting at 123 degrees Celsius. So that means if we buy a sample of benzoic acid from a place like Sigma Aldrich, and they say that it's pure, then I would bet that if we took the melting point of that pure benzoic acid, it would start melting at 122 degrees Celsius and did at 123 degrees Celsius. You've seen the melting point done within experiment one. So basically you saw the small vials that had the small amount of benzoic acid in the sample and you actually got to see those melt with the melt temp apparatus. Let's look at the table to make sure we're on the same page though about how you present that data. So here's an example table and I'm going to go off on it with a different set of compounds because the data is already here. All right. So just like you had benzoic acid, I'm going to guess you actually analyzed the, well, not guess. I know that you actually analyzed the data for recrystallized benzoic acid from a pure sample, recrystallized benzoic acid from an impure sample, as well as a melting point standard. This is a little bit different because in this case, what we're analyzing is an impure compound, urea, a recrystallized urea, which hopefully it's pure, but we don't really know, and then we need a melting point standard to compare this to. So for the melting point standards, you're going to look that up in the appendix of your e-workbook. So for the appendix of your e-workbook, that is down here. All this information is going to be very helpful to read. If you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, um, I recommend reading these because they're uh, very good introductions to most of the things that we're doing, especially this. I really enjoyed making these drawings here for the recrystallization. So back for experiment one, if you're having trouble comprehending what was happening in that process of recrystallization, this would be a great portion to read. Um, vac filtration, we also did with the recrystallization. We'll also do that for the isolation of solids for experiment three. Anyway, I got sidetracked and excited about all this stuff. What I was looking for is the melting point reference table. So for the melting point reference table, another good thing to read would be this, which talks about what you need to do when you're assessing the melting point, um, how to run a melting point assessment, and that's also presented in the experiment above. But what we're looking for is the best melting point standard to use for our assessment of urea, which has a melting point literature value of 133 to 135. So the closest value to that is benzamide. So that would be our melting point standard that we would select if we were going to assess the melting points of urea, recrystallized, and other sample of urea. So let's go back up to experiment two. And so for the melting point standard, we decided that benzamide was the best solvent. And we know the literature value of that, which is 125 to 128. This is the compound that we're going to use to double check to make sure our thermometer is actually reading accurately because we're betting a lot of money that our benzamide is pure. We know we recrystallize urea, but we're not 100% sure that it is actually pure. All right, so let's say that we do this in the experiment. And so benzamide, that solid in that very small tube, starts melting at 120, um, let's say 123. So benzamide starts melting at 123 and stops melting at 125. So that's the measured value that we got for the experiment. So this, we just literally were in the lab. We put these three samples in, and these are all of the measured values that we got for each sample.
For the melting range corrections, we're going to base that on our melting point standard. So we're, we know that benzamide's pure. That's what we're going to bet on. We're not 100% sure that the thermometer is reading accurately. So we need to adjust this if necessary. It looks like we do. It looks like we need to add three so that the end value of the measurement matches up with the end value that we know the literature value is for that compound. So we need to add three to all numbers in our table here. So our correction is going to be plus three. And then we can rewrite these values. So this ends up being 126 to 128. Because again, that number needs to be the same as that number for our melting point standard. So since we're adding three to everything, we're adding three to everything. And so we need to add th three to all these numbers. So urea is going to be 120 to 129, and that was impure urea. And um, recrystallized urea is going to be 130 to 133. All right, so that is the completed melting point table. So in the lab, what you're going to do is get three measured values, which you're going to see in the video. You're going to figure out the literature values for what those are expected to be. So ideally, recrystallized urea would be this. And we wrote this so that we've got something to compare this to. It's easier to compare it if you've got it in the table. You could also write 133 to 135 right here if you wanted to, because both of these compounds are urea. Both have the same relevance in either of these two categories, either looking for how close it is for your recrystallized urea or how far it is for the impure urea, because impurities always lower and broaden the melting range. And then benzamide is just basically our thermometer correction. So once we've made that correction, we can basically ignore the benzamide column here. There's really nothing else we need to look at because now we have these corrected values, which we care about, and we can look at it and compare them to the literature value. The recrystallized urea melts at 130 to 133. The lit value is 133 to 135. It looks like our corrected melting range for our analyzed recrystallized urea that we did in lab is slightly more low and broad than the literature value, which means that we definitely did a good job. We purified it a lot more than the impure sample, but it's still not as pure as pure urea. So there are still some impurities. It's relatively minor, but there are some impurities in the recrystallized urea that we're hypothetically analyzing here. For impure urea, it's definitely very impure. We have a very low and broad melting range. So impure urea, we're basically just confirming that Impure urea is indeed impure urea, and that's basically all we know. So it's not surprising because no attempt at purification was done, and it was assumed that it was impure when we started. Recrystallized urea, we got it closer to the literature value, but it still has some impurities in it. So that is basically the summary of this melting range table. Now what we could do is a TLC analysis and see, okay, do we see that impurity in urea? Can we actually see a spot corresponding to that impurity to possibly identify what that impurity is with our recrystallized urea and or our impure urea? So the next thing we're going to look at is the TLC analysis. All right, before we jump into the TLC analysis, let's go back and look at how the melting point and TLC are interrelated. So in this question, if we have pure crystals of benzoic acid, so the benzoic acid molecule is all that is making that crystal in structure. So this could, this is, what do we have? One, two, three, four, two, four, six, eight, ten or so. So we've got about 40 molecules of benzoic acid making a pure crystalline structure of benzoic acid. If we have 10% impurity, we said we had about 40 molecules of pure benzoic acid. That means that a compound with about the same molecular weight of benzoic acid, if it is, that would mean there are four impurities within that benzoic acid. So we could sit here and draw 40 crystals of benzoic acid again, which will take too long. So I'm going to limit that to closer to 12. Uh, let's do 20 or so. 20 crystals of impure benzoic acid. So sorry about the hand drawing, but let's pretend like these are very clean circles here. So if we have 20 crystals of benzoic acid and we say there are 
there's a 10% impurity, that means that we've got the impurity looks like that rectangle there. That means we would have two molecules of that impurity within our benzoic acid crystals. So this would be an impure sample. So based on the melting ranges table we looked at, if we had um, something like a very impure sample of benzoic acid, so let's say our ratio originally was more like, that's our benzoic acid, and let's say the impurity was this, where we had a lot of impurity in there. So let's say about 40% impurity. If we recrystallize that and got to impure crystals of benzoic acid with only 10% impurity, this would be similar to the analysis that we did. Now we're talking about benzoic acid here. We talked about urea in that melting point table. But for benzoic acid, if we were going to take the melting range of a sample like this, a sample with about 40% impurity, this would be an extremely low and broad melting range. So if I was going to guess the melting ranges on these values, I would guess that this would be about a very low and broad melting range. So let's say 70 to 90 degrees Celsius for this. If we have, let's say, 40% impurities. If we have 10% impurities, that's going to be quite a bit higher, close to the literature value for benzoic acid. So let's say that would be about 118 to 122. So a little bit more low and broad. We do have some impurities. And for pure crystals of benzoic acid, that's going to be the literature value, which is 122 to 123 degrees Celsius. All right, so hopefully we agree that impurities are always going to lower, in the bro lower and broaden the melting range of a sample. And then looking at melting range, oftentimes in this lab, that's confused with the boiling point of the compound, which is not the same thing. So if the melting range of benzoic acid is 122 to 123, the boiling point is going to be a lot higher. I don't know exactly what that is, so let's go back to benzoic acid and look that up. So, go back on Wikipedia. A lot of times these, these decompose too rather than boiling, so it may not even have a boiling point. All right, it looks like it does though, so 250 degrees Celsius is the boiling point of benzoic acid. So, 250 degrees Celsius. For water, the melting point is zero degrees Celsius, so ice starts melting after zero degrees Celsius, and water starts boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, for the red dye color, that has a melting point of around 300 degrees Celsius, and then the boiling point, if the melting range is that high, usually it decomposes before boiling, so there really is no boiling point for that. Urea is the same way, that also decomposes before boiling, and we looked at that already, that melting point is one. 33 to 135. We can't, again, we can't assess the melting point of red 40 because it's too high for our thermometers to read in the context of the organic chemistry lab at least, and it decomposes before boiling anyway. We've already discussed finding the melting point standard. We chose benzamide as the melting point standard to analyze our urea um, and correct those melting ranges. This would be a different example here. So I basically picked a different melting range for the melting point standard than here. This is close, but it would have been slightly different. So here, if we would, have, if it would have started melting at 122 and ended at 124, so if this number right here was 124, our correction would have been plus four to everything. So instead of all these plus three corrections, it would have been plus four, because again, we want to make sure the end value of our melting point standard for the corrected value matches the literature value. So again, if this was 124 for a melting point standard benzamide here, we'd have to add four to get to 128, so that way these two values match. That means we have to add four to everything. So this would have actually been 134, this would have been 131, this would have been 121, and this would have been 130. So in that case, if that was the case, then we would have assessed our recrystallized urea as being slightly more pure than what our assessment was for this. The corrected table is already done. Um, we already picked the melting point standard. Um, for benzoic acid, we use the same melting point standard. So 120, 
5 to 128 is very close to 122 to 123, so that same melting point standard should be used. For the reasons why we run these all simultaneously, we want to make sure we're using the same, same thermometer for sure. It's more efficient to run all three simultaneously. We can just get all three values in one run rather than doing three separate runs. And the rate at which the temperature increases needs to be consistent for all values. So all the temperature readings need to be relative to each other and the rate at which the temperature increases might have an impact on your estimate estimate for the start and end value of when it actually turns from a solid to a liquid. Um, for this, you could do a um, relative ratio here to find out what you would turn the dial to, but if you want to quickly get up to about 80 degrees Celsius, I would say you'd want to turn that dial to about three, so basically 30% of the 25 to 250 range would get you to about 80 degrees Celsius. In the lab, you'll get comfortable with that. Uh, if you take organic too and have to take a lot of melting ranges, you'll turn the dial to about two or three, let the temperature jump up a little bit, and then slowly increase it so the temperature keeps increasing to a point before you want your samples to melt, and then it'll climb through that range where you analyze it closely and actually watch it melt. All right, for the procedure, again, for experiment one, your benzoic acid samples were already weighed. So we basically already have done that. And that should be part of the previous experiments, at least in your notebook. I don't believe there are any post-lab questions related to that, but at least in your notebook, you should have the percent recovery of benzoic acid calculated. And then for the post-lab questions, post-lab question, I believe 12 on this worksheet, relates to that assessment. For the melting range, we're not going to do anything more with the melting range. We basically already talked about an example on how to correct those values. Um, I believe you have the melting range values in that previous video as well. And let's look at the post lab questions. Um, yeah, so for the previous video, you're also going to include the table here for the melting range assessment of benzoic acid. So based on what we talked about before and what was presented in the video for experiment one, you're going to actually answer questions from experiment one on this post-lab worksheet. So it should be in your notebook for your experiment one entry. And then on this post-lab worksheet, you're going to answer questions related to your assessment for benzoic acid here and here. So questions 11 and 12 for percent recovery, as well as the melting point assessment. For percent recovery for this, we're just going to take the original mass and we're going to take the recovered mass and divide the two. So it's going to be the amount recovered divided by the initial weight weighed of the impure sample or original sample and multiply that by 100% to get your percent recovery. All right, let's talk about the practice and optimization of a TLC plate. So for a TLC plate, the goal is to have a TLC plate, spot the compounds that you want to analyze on the plate, and then basically see how far they run up the plate. So the reason why you'd want to do that is because if we had, let's say, compound A right here, which I drew naphthalene, and compound B, which I'm not sure the name of this, but it's a very polar compound for sure, if it'd be possible to make, these two compounds have significantly different polarities. And if we made these, we want, might want to see if there's an impurity involved in these compounds. So let's say we were trying to make compound B and our starting material to make compound B was a similar compound, but let's say we wanted to add that halogen on, on the last step of our synthesis. So we had, let's say, a carboxylic acid, an alcohol, and we knew our starting material did not have that chlorine on, on the compound. So there's just a hydrogen on our aromatic ring. So let's say that's compound C. All right, so if we were gonna spot these compounds on the plate, We'd want to maybe draw a faint line here just above. That way we know exactly where we've spotted them. We'd have compound A and compound B. So we're spotting what we think is compound A right here, what we think is compound B right here, and we're hoping that we don't see any compound C, but we don't know if compound C is in compound B or not. So what we do is put this in a beaker, and then we'd add some solvent to it, and let's say we added the nonpolar solvent hexanes. 
we'd add the solvent so that the solvent line was about halfway up to the line where we spotted our compounds on the plate, and then we allowed the solvent to travel up the plate. So hexanes, when we put this in here, would climb up the plate. And if possible, it would carry a compound with it. And so our solvent front line, basically once that hexanes ran all the way up to the plate, and really to allow it to do that, we'd have to put a glass watch glass over the top of the beaker so that the solvent wasn't evaporating as it was climbing up the plate. If that was going to happen and we put in hexanes there, I bet naphthalene, since it's so nonpolar, would travel up with the hexanes. So really we would not see that dot there after the plate ran. We would see the spot and I bet naphthalene would go fairly far up the plate. I bet compound B wouldn't move very far up at all. So it might move to right there, which means we may or may not see that spot right there. So after we ran the plate, that's what it would look like. So again, hexanes was the solvent. Hexanes looks like this, where we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in our carbon chain. That's a nonpolar organic solvent. It's going to try to carry up the compounds up the plate, but it can't disrupt the interactions that silica gel, which is polar, has with polar compounds. So our polar compounds don't travel very far up the plate. So B did not move very far. C did move pretty far up the plate because it had weak interactions with the silica gel. And so hexanes, a nonpolar solvent, was able to carry it pretty far up the plate. Let's quickly jump to what this actually looks like in lab. So if we go here, it's on personal preference, but might as well be quick. For the TLC plate, you're going to see this in experiment three. I'm just going to mute myself real quick here. So right now, I'm basically getting a compound that's already dissolved in a solvent. We have to dissolve it in that, in that solvent so we can actually spot it on the plate. And I'm spotting it on the TLC plate and I'm about to put it in a beaker. That is what the plate looks like under UV light. So we've spotted the compounds on the plate and that's what it looks under like under UV light. It's crucial to check that under UV light so we can see if we've actually spotted it on the plate. So again, we dissolved it in the solvent when we spot it on the plate, all we see really is the solvent being spotted on the plate and then evaporating. So we've got to check it under UV light to make sure that the compound is actually spotted on the plate. And so after the solvent dries, we've confirmed that it is spotted on the plate. We'll add a solvent to the beaker and then we'll put the plate in the beaker so that the solvent can start running up the plate. Now notice that the original solvent line is actually halfway between the line where we spotted the compounds and where the solvent line is. That way when we dip the plate in there, we don't just simply dissolve the compounds that we spotted on the plate into solution. So the solvent is now climbing up the plate and it's carrying the compounds with it a certain distance up the plate. If it's a polar solvent, it's going to carry polar compounds up high on the plate. It's also going to carry nonpolar compounds really high up on the plate, probably at the solvent front line, which means we may not even be able to see the spot. And so if you give it enough time, that's how high it's going to travel to. We're going to mark that solvent front line and analyze the compounds. So we'll, again, that's in more detail in the other video. But going back to this, let's look at some of these interactions and what we can do in situations where, let's say something doesn't travel up the plate hardly at all, or it travels too far up the plate. If it travels too far up the plate, we need a less polar solvent. So if we've got hexanes, you really don't get much less polar than that. That means the compound is extremely nonpolar and there aren't a lot of options for what to do to make it less polar. Now, if the solvent is hexanes and you're analyzing a polar compound, there are definitely things we could do. One of them that's discussed in this specific experiment is add some ethyl acetate. So ethyl acetate is slightly more polar than hexanes, so it would actually carry compound B further up the plate. And so th let's think about the plate. So if we had ethyl acetate, what that means is that we could actually start analyzing and see maybe if we could see compound C. So compound C probably has a probably is less polar than compound B. 
And so that means that it would actually climb further up the plate. So let's say that we actually ran this, and let's say we switched to just that last state. So this is very low on the plate. We actually want it to move up the plate a little bit so we can analyze it. So let's say we ran this, um, we spotted again, compound B, we ran ethyl acetate, we ran it up the plate, our solvent line was here, and when we looked at the spots under UV light to see where those spots actually were, let's say we saw a spot right here and a spot right here. This spot right here was relatively faint, so that was smaller and a little bit less noticeable than this spot right here, which was the main spot. Again, we said that compound C was going to be a little bit less polar. This was going to be a little bit more polar. So in this case, the more polar, or in all cases, the more polar compound doesn't travel as far up the plate. So this spot right here is actually B. And this spot right here is C. So this is the more nonpolar one that went further up the plate. So what that means is that actually when we looked at B here and we saw that spot, we probably did see a spot still at the baseline. And this little spot that we, see, we saw climbing up here was actually compound C. So that was actually the impurity in our mixture. B just simply didn't move off the solvent line. So with these plates, then you can either add more polar or less polar solvents to push them further up the plate or not as far up the plate, depending on what you want. And so looking at these solvents, hexane is definitely the least polar solvent. Diethyl ether, so an oxygen with two ethyl groups, is um, slightly less polar than that. So if we're ranking these um, ethyl acetate, rank these solvents, and or most polar to least polar is five. Hexanes would be five, diethyl ether would be four, ethyl acetate, which looks like this, would be three, and acetone, which looks like that, would be two, and ethanol, which looks like that would be the most polar. So ethanol would carry anything farther up the plate. Hexanes would carry things the least far up the plate. If we had very nonpolar compounds we were analyzing, we want to start with hexanes because we don't want things to run at the top of the solvent front line and not be able to hardly even see the spots. For the three types of intermolecular interactions, that relates to this because things like, so ethanol can hydrogen bond with itself it disrupts any hydrogen bonds that our compound might have with a silica gel. So it more, would more strongly disrupt the hydrogen bonding that's happening between the silica gel and the alcohol and carboxylic acid functional groups on compound B and C, which is really that hydrogen bonding potential is what allows ethanol to push things so far up the plate. You also have dipole-dipole moments. So if you have something like an oxygen bonded to a carbon, this is definitely going to pull electron density up towards the more electronegative atom, creating a dipole moment where electron density is pushed more in one direction, more on one atom than the other atom. So that's another um, factor determining how polar the compound is, how far it's going to push things up the plate. The other type of interaction is van der Waals forces, which is a pretty general application for all types of intermolecular interactions and is really the least relevant for analyzing um, where compounds are going to move and how far compounds are going to push things up the plate. Um, so which of the previous compounds of all three type of intermolecular forces? If you look at ethanol, ethanol can hydrogen bond with itself, so that is the clear winner. Now if we're looking at something like ethyl acetate, this can hydrogen bond with something like compound B Hydrogen, compound B can hydrogen bond with ethyl acetate because that hydrogen right there can interact with the oxygens of ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate just can't hydrogen bond with itself because it doesn't have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen on that molecule. And in terms of boiling point, if you look at the boiling point of all these, you'll see that ethanol has the highest boiling point of all these options. Again, it has stronger interactions with itself so it takes a higher temperature to disrupt that interaction so that it can actually convert from a liquid to a gas or, in other words, boil.
So I'll let you look at this. So it's really the same type of question, and this was actually on this is actually on the post lab quiz for answering this, basically ranking these in order of polarity. So same concept as looking at the solvents. These compounds are just slightly larger compounds, and we don't use this, use them as solvents. Um, when we're looking at things on the TLC plate, usually it has there has to be an aromatic ring or conjugated pi bond somewhere to actually absorb and then reflect that UV light back so we can actually see it. So that's really the reason why when we're looking at things under UV light, we usually don't see the solvent, but we do see the compounds that we're spotting. When we're calculating the RF value, so the RF value is the distance the compound traveled. So in this case, we've got two spots here. Let's call this spot A and this spot B. We would have two RF values for whatever we decided to name this. So let's say we named this spot number one. So spot number one has two RF values because spot number one has compound A and compound B in it. So when we measure the RF values, that's the distance the compound traveled. So the distance here divided by the distance of the solvent front, that distance right there. So let's say the solvent traveled 6 centimeters and compound A traveled 2 centimeters and compound B traveled 4 centimeters. So for compound A, the RF value is 2 over 6, which is 1 third, which is 0.33, and for B, that is 4 over 6, which is 2 thirds, which is 0.6, repeating. So that would be the RF value of compound A and the RF value of compound B. So in this case, on the plate, we can see which of these two is the more or less concentrated. So A looks like a there's less amount of A there. The spot in general is smaller. So we saw one spot when we spotted this mix of compounds there. A looks like a smaller spot. So we basically just are barely seeing that. That is probably at a lower concentration for our mixture in sample one. And then B is at a higher concentration. There's more of B within that spot for that compound. So that's another visual observation you can have is the relative amount of those compounds you see for your TLC analysis. And then looking at this, so if we have a different ratio of these solvents, we know that hexanes is less polar than ethyl acetate. So the more ethyl acetate we have in the ratio, the higher things in general will be pushed up the plate. So if in this example, so in figure 2.3, let's say we theoretically used the two hexanes to um, a one ethyl acetate ratio for this. If we were to switch that up and use a one hexanes to one ethyl acetate mix and run that same plate again, where our original spot line is here, our, sol our, our original spot line is here, our solvent ran up to here, take a minute and think about where you think these compounds A and B would run to on this plate. So in this case, we've got more hexanes, so more nonpolar solvent and less ethyl acetate. Here we've got one hexanes to one part ethyl acetate. So we'd originally spot compound one. We put this in a beaker, use that solvent to run up the plate. And for this, since we have less hexanes, we have less nonpolar solvent and more polar solvent, in this case, things would be pushed higher up the plate. It might be a little bit too much. So B might be actually pretty much on the solvent front line, and then A would be up around here. So in this case, our RF value for A would be about 0.7, and our RF value for B, which ran higher up the plate, would be at about 0.95. So in this case, this would not be the best choice. 
So if the two hexanes to one ethyl acetate mixture pushed at this high of the plate, this would be the best choice. We've got pretty good separation. They're both about in the middle of the plate. This is the best option. If it pushed it where something was at the top of the plate, we have too much polar solvent in solution, and so we need to minimize that. We'd have to dilute this with more hexanes so that we actually got a better plate reading. And for the rest of this, this basically walks you through a procedure to follow to spot compounds and then analyze your mixture. I think at this point we've talked about all the important concepts there. When you run the plate and look at it under UV light, you always want to circle those compounds because you can't see the spots after you take it off the UV light. So you can see the spots under UV light, you run it up the plate, you can't see the spots, you look at it under UV light, and you circle those spots under UV light so you can actually take it back and measure it without looking too much at the UV light to destroy your eyes. So that's basically what this is talking about here. So basically you'd want to clearly show the baseline, clearly show the solvent where the solvent front ran up to, so mark that solvent front line, and then clearly circle all your spots. In this case we'd be doing analysis of comparison. For a lot of these labs you're asked to do analysis there, comparing with other groups. In this case, this is not applicable. So you'd maybe you want to do some theoretical analysis in terms of how successful the reaction was and maybe what some of those problems were. But if it says do a group comparison and there are no groups to compare with, just don't worry about that question and reword it to something more relevant for you to just present a good understanding of the experiment. All right, so that should be enough information for you to successfully finish the post-lab worksheet. Here are some examples of what happens on a TLC plate. Uh, I think that most of it's been covered except for this one right here. So if you spot way too much compound on a TLC plate, it's probably just going to drag. So a lot of times that's why you will see a drag there. It could also be that you just need to use a different solvent to run it. But So either too much or a different solvent is necessary if you see that drag. I think the rest of the concepts were covered in detail within the video. All right, so that's the, ex the end of the Experiment 2 video. Um, that is all I have to say for that. Um, if you have any questions for me, definitely send me an email, definitely comment on the videos, so definitely the help video, as well as this video, that'll be helpful for everyone, I'll answer your comments on the video, and then other people can respond too, give some input, maybe give you an answer, or maybe ask a different question after they see my answer. So for this, um, I'm going to basically be giving extra credit um, throughout, the throughout the summer semester, the more comments you have for those videos.